Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Gray Refuel, where we cap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Susano, and today's the 23rd of November, 2021. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So, a little less drama in today's episode, but just something I wanted to cover. I put out a tweet out today because I woke up and I saw that uh, fees on the kind of Avalanche network were creeping up. And now, obviously, we know all of these kind of like other uh, layer one networks are advertising and marketing themselves as kind of like the low fee chain, right? Obviously, because Ethereum has high fees. Uh, and then I put this tweet out where I said, you know, turns out fees go higher when the chain has actual usage and none of these monolithic L1s have actually solved scalability. Now, regular Daily Gway watchers, listeners, readers will know exactly what I'm talking about here by just kind of upping the gas limit. Reusing what we already have does not solve scalability in any way. It is not a long-term sustainable solution. It is not separating the concerns like we've discussed before between consensus, uh, and security, uh, execution, and, and data concerns. That all comes with the modular approach to, to a blockchain. We've discussed this uh, kind of ad nauseum, so I'm not going to recap it there. And then I kind of attached this GIF where I was just kind of like, you know, uh, this GIF of, the, of, of this guy being like sort of uh, shocked at, the, at, um, at what happened. But like, I wasn't shocked at all. I fully expected this. So a lot of Ethereans have been calling this for a long time now. So it shouldn't have come in a sh as a shock to anyone, really, that was paying attention. And, you know, this is just what happens. And, you know, the funny thing is, this isn't actually bearish for the Avalanche C chain. Because more obviously more usage is is bullish for for the chain, right? And I think they burn fees as well. Um, so yeah, it's not exactly bearish. But the funny thing is, is that I, I hope this kind of like opens people's eyes to the fact that Ethereum isn't the only one that is ever going to run into scalability issues. Every single platform will. There is no such thing as infinite scalability. And I know some other chains like Solana advertise more scalability, but if they had a consistent uh, kind of like 50,000 transactions per second, uh, they would hit their limit. They'd have to up their limit from there. Uh, uh, and, you know, they, they do obviously plan to do that in the future, but then the hardware requirements get more insane and it just kind of like tumbles down from there. So... No one has solved scalability. The closest we have to solving the scalability trilemma is Ethereum's roll-up centric roadmap. And that is still a couple of years out from being fully realized. Uh, and we don't even know if it's going to be the holy grail we all make it out to be. I mean, it works in theory, of course, but practice could be a different thing. Um, but I, I, you know, I haven't seen any holes in it. I can't find anyone who can poke holes in it. Um, and just a quick refresher for those who don't remember, the roll-up centric roadmap um, inverts the scalability trilemma because essentially we are able to achieve more scale um, the more decentralized the chain becomes, which is insane because previously the scalability trailer posits that you cannot be more scalable the more decentralized you are. And we're basically inverting that um, and making it so that we can do that because we're going to have uh, uh, layer one as the settlement layer and, and the data availability layer. We're going to have the layer two as the execution layer, and then we can add more data shards to the, the kind of like beacon chain as more validators come online, which decentralizes the network out further. So that's exactly why, you know, everyone in the Ethereum ecosystem is so hyped about Ethereum's roll-up centric roadmap and the modular design rather than the monolithic design that we're all kind of like seeing play out and seeing the limitations of over and over and over again. It's the same thing. It's the, the same tune is going to be played every single time. It just takes until these things kind of like get more usage. And, you know, Avalanche C chain isn't even full yet they don't have full blocks yet but the the, the fees are already creeping up now um you know so, someone worked out if that if uh, the price of kind of like the avax token was the same as eth the fees would actually be the same <laughs> which is quite which again is insane to think about as well right in terms of dollar terms obviously not and those are native kind of token terms. Um, and the reason why the fees are actually going up, a big reason, and the same reason they are higher on Ethereum, is MEV. There's a lot of MEV opportunities now. I, you know, I saw a tweet the other day that uh, MEV extractors on Avalanche uh, are printing thousands, uh, sorry, thousands, millions of dollars a day in MEV extraction, which is just a crazy amount of money. And, be, you know, because of that, they're willing to pay whatever fees necessary to extract that MEV. So this shouldn't come as a surprise to any of you. Like, I, I know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. But I always think it's worth reiterating these points, especially because I know that you know there's new, new, newer kind of people tuning in and, th and things like that. Um, and Polly and I actually had a great tweet today where they put out a comparison between kind of like the Avalanche C chain, which is the EVM compatible chain, it's the main chain everyone uses, and layer two solutions on Ethereum. So you can see here a swap on the Avalanche C chain at time of tweet from Polly and I here was eight dollars forty. I think it actually went all the way up to twenty dollars. Um, on Looprink, it would be a dollar. On, on ZK Sync, using ZigZag, it would be a around a dollar. Arbitrum, 
an optimistic Ethereum, it would be around $5. And these are unoptimized rollups, of course. And also the funny thing is, is that the rollups, uh, you know, are, are unoptimized, but they're not, nowhere near their full capacity as I've described before. So, you know, once, once they do hit their limits, obviously the fees will go up from there. But the thing is, is that they're nowhere near their limits and they scale much, much better than a monolithic chain, such as the, the Avalanche chain or even the Ethereum layer one chain, right? I mean, it's the same kind of thing. It's always the same kind of monolithic design there. And then you can look at a transfer on the Avalanche chain. It's a dollar 18 on Polygon Hermes is 25 cents, Loop Ring 54 cents, ZK Sync 65 cents. And Polynow obviously notes, remember these are early unoptimized rollups. Optimized rollups go much lower than this as, as I've kind of like talked about before, as I've described before. Uh, and then, you know, there was a bunch of comments in the replies and Polynow kept, uh, you know, replying back to them with all of the, the facts that they always drop. It's just amazing how, how, how kind of like knowledgeable they are about the layer two space. But I thought this was a great comparison because I mean, as I said, no matter what layer one chain it is, they're all going to run into the same issue. And layer two isn't immune from this either. But what layer two does, it basically gives us more bang for our buck. That's, that's kind of like a good way to put it, where we get much more scalability out of layer two than we do out of kind of like layer one. And we can throw much more kind of like resources at layer two because we're not settling there. We're just doing the execution there. So that separation of concerns again, we're settling that execution and the data on layer one. Now, as data sharding comes online, obviously that gets cheaper, but then we have hybrid constructions like a Validium or a Volition or a ZK Porter, where you can have data off chain, have just the proofs of your um, trans uh, uh, proofs of the execution on chain, and that will still be more secure than a standalone uh, L1 or a, or a side chain, whatever you want to call it. Um, it'd still be better than that. Uh, so from that perspective, Ethereum is pretty much going to win long term. I, I, I honestly have zero doubt that Ethereum is going to scale uh, and is going to scale, you know, really, really quickly over the, over the next couple of years in like a really, really grand way. It's just a waiting period now. And I do think that... Um, these AVM side chains are going to be the first things that get absolutely obsoleted by uh, kind of like layer twos. Obviously, as I mentioned yesterday, we need these tokens as well to bootstrap this growth. But the thing is, I mean, layer twos with minimal token incentives have over six billion dollars locked in them right now, which is which is crazy to think about. They're still so early. I mean, as I said, Arbitrum and Optimism are nowhere near their final kind of forms, not even close to it. They've still got transaction limit caps on. They have no token incentives to bootstrap their growth. They have no call data compression. Uh, and, you know, there's all these kind of other optimizations that can be made. And they're going to be made. And that's not to mention all the ZK stuff that's coming as well. Look, guys, seriously, if you can't see the vision at the, at this point in time, which I'm sure you all can, but if you can't, then, uh, you know, I can't really convince you any, any further than that. But I do think that the fact that, you know, these other chains get higher fees, uh, people kind of like reflect on that. And, and maybe some people in the Avalanche community are like, oh, well, okay, maybe uh, maybe that I was wrong about, um, thinking that these, th this was going to be a cheap chain forever. Maybe, you know, you actually do need layer twos. And then you kind of get more people coming into the Ethereum vision, the Ethereum kind of modular vision. So that's what I like the most about these sorts of things is that, uh, as I've said before, you can't win a narrative war. It's so much, it, it's okay, you know, to say things and you can say it as many times as you want, but until someone actually sees it play out in reality, um, most people just don't, don't kind of like believe that. So now we're seeing it play out in reality. I mean, I said it for months and months and months on end where I said layer one blockchains do not scale. It doesn't matter how much you throw at it. They do not scale long-term. It is not healthy. It's not sustainable. Their fees are going to go up no matter what you do. Uh, and this played out exactly as, you know, it wasn't just me. It was a lot of other people as well, just exactly as we all predicted it would play out. Um, and that shows people that we weren't full of shit. We're not just being ETH maxis. We're not just trying to quote unquote cope over another chain getting adoption. I actually like that these EV side chains exist because it means that people still stay within the ethereum ecosystem um, because the evm is still ethereum they're still using the same kind of tools so that when the layer twos are ready for them they're already going to be kind of like um, evm savvy right ethereum savvy without even knowing that they are which is really cool so i have no issue with these things existing i just have an issue with them are uh, marketing themselves as a solution when they're not they're not at all uh, a solution to anything other than short-term kind of like relief until they themselves get clogged up and they just end up the same as Ethereum layer one. So this is why we need layer twos. This is why we need, um, you know, the, uh, the roll-ups and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, as I said, preaching to the choir, but thought it was worth reiterating for all of you on that. Uh, on to the next topic. So I saw this tweet today from this account called Ralphie. It's not a crypto account, but it has a picture of uh, all these kind of like popular stocks that are, you know, and how far below their all-time high they are. 
I hadn't noticed that stocks were acting this badly because I typically don't pay attention to stocks. I really pay attention to tech stocks the most, like, you know, your Microsofts, your Apple, your Tesla, your Amazons, like the bigger ones, right? Um, and if you look at this, look at all the stocks and look at how far below all-time high they are. If we start from the bottom and we start from like known companies, like companies that aren't actually kind of like just, you know, um, meme companies and aren't actually kind of like, uh, just like meme coins that pumped during the, you know, the last kind of like year or so. Um, Zillow, right? It's like a real estate app in the US, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, or a real estate kind of like ecosystem. It's down 72% from its all-time high. Tencent Music, um, like, like Tencent's a massive platform, down 76% from its all-time high. Robinhood, down 58% from its all-time high. Zoom, 55%. Alibaba, 55%. Baidu, which is China's version of Google, 55%. Lyft, I mean, you know, down by 40%. There's a bunch of other names in here that you'll recognize. But uh, I didn't realize stocks, <coughs> stocks were performing this badly. And I put a tweet out where I said, crypto is doing pretty well comparatively relatively to, to these stocks, because I know, you know, we've been kind of like floundering around all time high. We went to almost 5,000. Now we're back at what, 41, 30. If I look at the chart, uh, Bitcoin's been doing the same thing, just floundering around. There's been a bunch of things that have pumped. Obviously these alt L1s have pumped a little bit and there's been like the DeFi 2.0 stuff and all that stuff going on. And NFTs kind of like had a bit, you know, of a, of a, of a kind of like renaissance and then kind of went back to, to dumping. So it's just a weird thing in the market right now where, you know, stocks are performing really bad. A lot of stocks are performing really badly. Not all of them, but a lot of them seem to be. Crypto is doing really well compared to it. And there are other stocks that are just like hitting their all-time highs, right? You have like the Microsofts, Amazons, the Teslas, all that. They're at their all-time highs, basically. And they just keep chugging along. They're trillion-dollar companies, which is just insane, right? Um, so... You know, people are saying, you know, should we be bearish? Should we be, bull be bullish? We don't know. Um, all this kind of like stuff, when you think about it, it's kind of like really hard to know where the kind of like wider market's going to go. But what I find really positive is that even though some stocks are comparatively weak to crypto, crypto is still hanging on. Crypto still feels strong, at least to me. I know that we've been kind of like coming down lately and that's, that's fine, right? That happens. But I don't know, like unless the macro environment totally kind of like shits itself, I just don't see crypto going into a long-term bear market. I mean, I don't even think we're in a bear market at all because bear markets are defined by kind of like long periods of just like constant downtrending. I mean, when we first crashed with with uh, in May from like 4,400 to 1,700, that was done in like a week, right? That's not something that took, uh, you know, a little while to play out, right? It kind of like just happened in a week and then we kind of floundered around, of course, went back and uh, up and down and stuff. And everyone was like, you know, was that the end or the, is this the end? And it, and it wasn't, of course. We went back to almost 5,000. Well, we went to almost 5,000, which was a new all-time high. And now we've come back to just uh, over 4,000. So... I'm not sure where we go from here. I'm obviously still bullish, but uh, I don't know. Like, it just feels like the markets globally right now are kind of like just all weird. And I think that's got to do with the macro environment, right? Like, we had COVID, we, had lots of, we have lots of inflation. Now we have economies trying to kind of like come back. You know, it's funny. I was actually, in, as I said yesterday, I was in the city with my fiance, uh, Melbourne city. Um, the city was kind of like dead. There wasn't really anyone there. And we were on on the weekend when it's supposed to be busiest. And then we were, we were there on Monday as well. And, um, you know, usually it's busy, not busier on Mondays because of people going to work and stuff. But the offices were still pretty much like all empty. So it was kind of surreal to see that. Obviously, like Melbourne had a much longer lockdown than everywhere else. And there's still like restrictions and things like that. Not really. I mean, we're kind of like out of lockdown, but there are still kind of like other restrictions. And I think that the world just went through such a massive transformation over the last couple of years that it's just kind of like hard to tell where we go from here. But obviously, I'm still extremely bullish on crypto. I don't foresee any kind of long term bear market playing out for crypto. I think, you know, when you look at individual assets, I don't know kind of like where any of them are going to go except really ETH. Like I believe ETH is obviously still very bullish, but there's been a lot of DeFi tokens that have performed really poorly, even though the projects are still growing. Um, there's been kind of like uh, other random things popping off and it's just yeah it's a weird place to be right now so i just figured i'd kind of like give my general thoughts on that but of course i'm still doing my daily eth buys that doesn't stop uh, that never stops but uh it's gonna be interesting to see if we end you know the year at an all new all-time high if we just wait till next year to do it it's gonna be uh very interesting uh to see how all that plays out so Kane put out a tweet today that I kind of like wanted to touch on because there's a bunch of layer two stuff to talk about. But essentially he said, at this point, my plan is to just keep funding, building and deploying projects on optimistic Ethereum until you all capitulate and join me. So, I mean, I think this is what needs to happen, right? This needs to be, there's this massive effort from the Ethereum community to get onto L2s, right? 
and get onto kind of like um, uh, roll-ups in general and get these projects to move there. I'm a bit disappointed how slow kind of like Aave has been to move to Arbitrum because, uh, you know, they, they're, they're on the kind of like Arbitrum portal. They've they've obviously said they're going to move there, but they've been very, very slow to get there. And that's actually a critical missing piece, a money market on, on Arbitrum or a lot, like a large, well-known money market. And that's what's holding back a lot of adoption, I think. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping to see them obviously on Arbitrum and Optimism and all that sort of stuff. And Optimism obviously still has their whitelist, which is slowing things down a bit. But still, there's stuff being deployed there, stuff happening on there. And the networks are still kind of like growing in usage. They're not just stagnating. But obviously, they're moving slower than we would like. Um, but I, I think that's definitely going to change over the at least the next 12 months. I think it's going to happen much, much faster. As I said yesterday, I expect most of these L2s, generalized L2s, to have tokens within the next six months. That's going to um, supercharge the growth a lot, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think Kane is 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 is, um, is on point putting this tweet out there just to get the signal out there that let's get as many projects onto you know optimistic Ethereum onto rollups in general, and let's not wait around. Like, this, what's what are we waiting for at this point? Like, the fees are already high on layer one. We need to transition users to layer two. Um, let's just let's just get it done. Really, at the end of the day, uh, and that's you know exactly what Mahalo is trying to do by getting Uniswap on the Polygon POS chain. Obviously. The POS chain isn't a true layer two or whatever, but it's still part of the Ethereum kind of um, ecosystem. And uh, he gave an update today on his effort saying that there was a high level of support for that proposal. Now there's phase one of the governance process, which is a temperature check that can that is being done on snapshot here. So if you want to, uh, if you have uni um, or you ha you're, you're delegating to someone, you can definitely go here and get them to vote yes on this, which is basically to get a Uniswap V3 deployed to Polygon's POS chain. So awesome to see this making uh, a move here and not just kind of like uh, stagnating. Uh, Polly now put out an update with uh, basically an update from the Starkware community call. So he's got Starknet updates from the community call number two. They're on track for the alpha mainnet release this month. As I've been telling you guys, I expected it would come late November, which I mean, it's the 23rd right now. We're a week away from the end of November. It's going to come this week if it does, or maybe even early next week. Uh, Volition is coming in January, starting with a data availability committee, but committed to permissionless solutions in the future. So as I've discussed before, Volition is the is Starkware's kind of like um new feature where users have the option to either uh kind of like run in zk rollup mode or or kind of like in validium mode so validium mode being data off chain zk rollup mode being data on chain so that's what's coming in january which is awesome very close there and starkware said that they're committed to full decentralization for sequencer and proving by mid 2022 which means that a token is coming by mid 2022 for starkware that's the only way they can do this so as i said within the next six months they're all going to have tokens so um this this is really exciting. Obviously, I'm super excited to see Starknet's Alpha go live end of this month on mainnet to see which projects kind of spin up on there, see people getting, you know, on, on board and on there, playing around with it. Obviously, all the other efforts are making progress too, like Polygon ZK effort, ZK Sync within the next three months, as was teased yesterday. Arbitrum Nitro coming, Optimism with their OVM 2.0 upgrade live now. Yeah, it's really the golden age of layer twos. It's going to be the golden age for quite a while, guys. Like these layer twos may seem like they move, move slowly, but it all compounds. It all compounds over time and you get better and better scalability. And more and more apps are going to be deployed there. And we're all going to be enjoying a really awesome low fee experience, uh, especially with more of these kind of like centralized exchanges offering bridges, right? Like Arbitrum, uh, sorry, Binance supporting Arbitrum. They're going to be supporting the other L2s and then Coinbase as well. I've already committed to doing it. So very, very exciting time coming up in the L2 space. So Nick uh, Johnson from the ENS team teased uh, a kind of like a little book here where he said, I hear people are interested in buying the constitution. And this is kind of mock-up of the ENS DAO constitution, which was signed by 84,350 users, which were the users that claimed their ENS airdrop and kind of like... Um, agree to these these kind of like things when you click through and you, you claim your ENS airdrop you agree to a bunch of things with the ENS constitution and in this book would be uh, all the people who signed uh, and with their ENS name and their profile picture if they had it as well I you know I would ape this so hard like both an NFT and a physical edition I would be first in line to buy this and I would probably pay a lot of money for this I mean I paid a lot of money for my beacon book just so I could be like the number the one of one edition and the beacon book was like a, a book interviewing a bunch of ETH2 researchers it sits uh sits over here somewhere I'm, I'm looking for a good place to display it but um i would yeah i mean i would i would buy this so hard and i'd love to get be able to get my hands on this especially because i love that you know you have like nft profile pictures here that's absolutely awesome and everyone's ens names this is you know peak cultural items right like peak ethereum law right here so i'm hoping that this actually becomes a um 
a proper thing. This isn't just like a mock-up or a tease um, because I think that they'd get a lot of people buying this and all the proceeds could go to the ENS treasury as well. So they could hold more non-ENS token treasury assets, which is obviously very, very healthy for any treasury to hold uh, more of their non-kind of like native token assets. So cool to see this from Nick here. Hazu put out an interesting tweet today where he said, more people self-custody their ETH and other Ethereum-based assets than self-custody their BTC. I mean, this is like... Look, if we're being honest here, this is the most obvious thing ever, but it's funny that Hazu just kind of like puts it so bluntly because if you say this normally, you're going to get attacked by like Bitcoin maximalists <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, being like, no, they don't, you know, we, we pioneered not your keys, not your crypto, blah, blah, blah. But in reality, Bitcoin doesn't have what I call a um, self-custody forcing function. And this is what Ethereum has. And what I mean by this is that if you want to do anything on Ethereum, if you want to do DeFi, if you want to play around with NFTs, if you want to participate in DAOs, if you want to donate on Gitcoin, if you want to play around with layer twos, you have to self-custody. You can't go through an intermediary to do this or a third party to do this, at least pretty much most of it, right? Um, and I'm not just talking about Ethereum layer one, obviously, the layer twos, the Polygon POS chain, all that sort of stuff. It's all on chain. So Ethereum actually forces users to self-custody even if they don't want to. Bitcoin has nothing like this because only the only thing that Bitcoin does is secure BTC, the asset. And sorry, if we're being totally honest here, most users don't want to custody their own BTC. They're happy to leave it in a centralized exchange where if it's Coinbase, it's, it's actually insured up to a certain amount. They feel much safer about it because it's someone else's problem. They don't have to worry about it. They don't have to worry about, you know, securing their seed phrase and everything like that. I obviously don't encourage people to do that. If you are comfortable self-custodying, you definitely should. And if you're not, maybe just look into it a bit more and get comfortable with it because, uh, I, I, you know, I, I feel like self-custodying of your own assets is like one of the key kind of like points of this whole ecosystem. So, but I know like a lot of you guys do a lot of on-chain stuff. I mean, we all do on Ethereum. So it's not controversial to say that more people are going to self-custody their ETH and other Ethereum-based assets, especially when it comes to things like NFTs. Like you can't custody NFTs anywhere but on Ethereum. So if you want to buy an NFT, if you want to trade NFTs, it's all done on-chain um, or on L2. So from that perspective, um, you know, this tweet from Hazu makes total sense. And it's just a tough pill to swallow, I think, for Bitcoiners who coined the term, not your keys, not your crypto. And I, th I still think it's admirable that they keep pushing that, right? I still think it's proper that they keep pushing that. But as more, as we kind of like progress through this ecosystem and as Bitcoin has no um, forcing function for people to actually to self custody besides people saying that oh well you know if you don't have your you know your own kind of like crypto and, and you don't self custody then it's not actually yours it's basically an IOU that's not enough to get people over the line I'm sorry but that's just the way the world works what you need is utility and that's what Ethereum brings to the table and that's what it's always brought to the table so absolutely awesome to to kind of like um to see Hazu kind of like just putting it out there because for those of you who don't know Hazu is not uh in any one tribe he actually started out as a Bitcoiner was got very interested in ethereum but does a bunch of research across like you know the entire crypto ecosystem so for someone that doesn't have a tribe affiliation to say this it sends a much stronger signal than if i was to say this right because obviously people say oh, he's just an eth maxi he's just saying that when in reality it's true no matter who says it but it's it's great to see hazu kind of like saying this there so Vitalik put out a new document today discussing uh, the state of research of censorship resistance under proposed builder separation or PBS and some techniques that could increase it. Now, if you don't understand what that means, essentially from what I understand, this is a way to mitigate MEV. So this has been kind of like in research phase for quite a while. It's a way to separate um, the proposer of the kind of like uh, blocks from the builder of the, blo uh, of the blocks, I believe. I mean, you can read this. It's quite a technical document, but you can read it and you can see um, what they're kind of like uh, what they're thinking through. And it's an open research thing. It hasn't been solved yet. Um, but there are kind of like solutions put forward that may or may not go into the network. And um, this would apply to the beacon chain, not the current ETH1 network it would be after the merge, of course. Uh, this is obviously a critical problem. Like, I'm, like the thing about MEV, guys, is that long-term... MEV needs to be fixed because it is an existential threat to every single network because of the fact that MEV uh, makes it so that it, it, it brings forward perverse incentives to the network. And if those perverse incentives get bad enough, you could uh, actually lead to things like reorgs of the chain and stuff like that. Now, I've talked about this a few months ago when Edgar was talking about this on Twitter, about reorging the chain and how I believe that in almost all scenarios, it's never going to happen because of the fact that 
there's a lot of incentives to stop it from happening. But if MEV kind of like gets bad enough, it could happen. And there's other negative externalities of MEV as well, such as like fees going like absolutely bananas or, you know, skyrocketing, sandwich attacks, front running, back running, all this sort of stuff, right? So we definitely want to find a solution to that. And that's exactly what's being worked on here. So definitely go give this a read if you want to learn more about that. Danny Ryan put out uh, the latest update of Finalize. So this is number 32. So um, basically the TLDR is that Kintsugi, the merge... Um kind of like month-long November sprint is in progress. You can see the current progress here. They've reached milestone two onto milestone three, four, five, and six, of course, to get up to that DevNet. Uh, and this is both the execution and consensus layer reaching uh, milestone two, by the way. Um, and of course, another reminder to upgrade your Ethereum uh, one nodes uh, to uh, uh, the, the latest Arrow Glacier upgrade because that's going live on December 8th and that pushes back the difficulty bomb. So if you don't want to get stuck on an old chain, definitely upgrade your full nodes there. But yeah, great to see Kintsugi making progress. I mean, you can go to this link and see kind of like the live document of what's happening right now. So I feel like they'll probably hit milestone three and four this week and then hopefully five and six by by the uh, by the, the other week and then have that long uh, kind of like lived a uh, long lived dev net up during i guess uh, the holiday period to make sure that we can see if you know if, if you know we can break it we can kind of like test it thoroughly test it and then hopefully get uh something more kind of like uh up uh, 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 another sorry another test net going in the new year and then hopefully we get like a, a better window into when the merge is actually going to go live but i will definitely keep all of you up to date on that of course um, uh, cryptocurrency jobs turned four the other day. So November 22nd. So it's their fourth birthday. Uh, Daniel from cryptocurrency jobs put out a, a blog post here reflecting on, um, his four year journey with the, with the website, with the initiative here. You know, I've talked about cryptocurrency jobs, uh, the, a lot before on the refuel, of course, if you're looking for a job in crypto, this should be your first stop all the time. Always like definitely go just check out all the jobs on here. It's not just Ethereum. It's everything basically. So there are so many jobs of advertised on here right now in all different categories. I mean, design, engineering, finance, marketing, and everything, basically. So if you want to find a job, definitely go here. And um, Daniel also helps people as well to um, in finding a job. Um, he's very responsive. He, he's super passionate about what he does. And, you know, I've been friends with him for quite a while, work with him through Ethub and, and um, you know, on a bunch of different things. So, so yeah, definitely go uh, check out the kind of like brand new website as well. I, I should mention that. He re recently redesigned the website. Looks very, very cool. Um, and obviously celebrating the uh, the fourth birthday of cryptocurrency jobs, which is absolutely awesome. So happy birthday uh, to you, uh, to you, Daniel, for cryptocurrency jobs here. Great to see four years, and here's to another four years. All right, final reminder, guys. Uh, I reminded, I, I kind of brought this up last week on the refuel, but I keep getting sent these tokens, these spam scam tokens to my sasol.eth address. It is happening multiple times a day now. It's gotten really, really bad. There are, you know, tokens called Meta, People, Shib, Doge, some random, like absolutely random crap. I am not buying these things. I just a reminder again. I know probably none of you would fall for this, but if you know anyone that's kind of like um, maybe newer to the crypto, please warn them that uh, if they see tokens going to someone's public address just know that that could mean that that's just being sent to them it doesn't mean that they bought them even if it's coming from a uniswap pool as you can see on this screenshot this is tricky because it says it came from a uniswap pool and it went into my address i didn't buy this from uniswap guys it just came from there because that's uh, the um the creators sent it to me from there. So uh, please do not buy any of this stuff. Like, as I've said before, I will not actually buy tokens on my public address. I will never do that because I don't want people copy trading me. I don't want people watching what I'm doing. Um, that'll all be done on my non-public addresses. Uh, but yeah, if you see these random tokens, I mean... It <laughs> Obviously for us, it's common sense, but for newer people, it might not be. Please don't fall for this. I've had so many DMs about it saying, what's this meta token? Why are you buying so much of it? I'm not buying these tokens, like at all. Like I wouldn't do this ever. Like I'm not speculating. My ID gen days are over, guys. Like I don't do this anymore. I don't have time for, the <laughs> for this anymore. But also all of these tokens are scams that get sent to me. So please do not buy them. Do not kind of like, uh, obviously, if you see these sorts of things, make sure that um, you're doing your due diligence on stuff, you know. Um, but, you know, I mean, uh, almost like, 100% of the time, pretty much 100% of the time, any of this stuff that gets sent to me is not something that I have bought myself. So just a final reminder there. But on that note, I'm going to end it there for today. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give that video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone.